Hello everyone and welcome to CRAM Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian and Maria Digby, we bring you CRAM Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Welcome back everyone. Uh, today we'll have a look at an interesting paper comparing the value of non-contrast and contrast CT as a diagnostic tool for abdominal pain in the emergency department. We will then be starting a series of tutorials on specific statistical tests, including uh, both a description of the test overall and a practical example on how to run it on a free and open source software. I'll leave you to it. Hi everyone, I'm Maria, um, and we're talking about the diagnostic accuracy of unenhanced computer tomography for evaluation of acute abdominal pain in the emergency department. This was recently published in May 2023 in JAMA Surgery, um, and all the details are there for you to look at. Thank you. Wonderful. So let's uh, have a quick quiz through the background of this study. Now, uh, we do know from our clinical practice that the vast majority of um, indications for a CT scan that relates to abdominal pain uh, do require the use of IV contrast. Uh, it has become an essential part of the diagnostic process. Uh, and without it, it's, it's sometimes really a struggle to define certain types of diagnosis. Uh, in clinical practice, we encounter two scenarios where this becomes a uh, bit of a problem. One, um, AKI, or acute kidney injury, where patients... Uh, generally due to their underlying pathology, uh, come in with uh, renal failure. And uh, uh, there is a concern that contrast media used in the context of CT scans can worsen that uh, kidney failure. Now, uh, this is something that has been debated hugely in the literature, both between radiologists and intensive care physicians, et cetera, et cetera. There's one paper here that I'm mentioning, a 2019 review on uh, contrast nephropathy. Um, it's quite comprehensive and it does debunk some of the myths uh, surrounding this particular type of pathology. So um, have a look. I personally don't believe it is that much of an issue, having reviewed <clears throat> the literature I'm familiar with. Uh, a further problem is contrast allergy. Now, um, a few patients that I look at, looked after in the past sort of couple of years had contrast allergy. Uh, most of the time... Um, Either we can negotiate and do a CT without contrast or using different types of contrast like oral um, or, uh, or rectal, um, or, um, or simply we can use adequate protocols that generally involve the use of antihistamine and steroids to minimize the risk of significant reactions. But in the context of these potential issues, the authors ask themselves, what about a non-contrast CT scan? And I'll leave it to Maria now to talk about the aims of this study. So um, they wanted to determine whether the accuracy of an unenhanced CT scan of the um, abdomen and pelvis um, was, could be used instead of uh, subjecting people basically to a contrast enhanced CT um, for patients that had uh, acute abdominal pain in an emergency department setting. Gio, you said you right. wanted to do the PICO. Yeah, of course. Um, so, uh, if we have to translate this into a PICO format, um, we could say the patients attending the emergency department with abdominal pain uh, requiring um, an abdominal and pelvis CT scan. Uh, these patients would be adults, uh, are included in the study. The intervention <clears throat> uh, would be a CT without contrast because that's not the standard of care. The comparison, which is the gold standard, would be a CT with IV contrast. Uh, the outcome, uh, as the author described it, <clears throat> sorry would be the diagnostic penalty. That is to say, the loss of diagnostic accuracy associated with the use of a non-contrast CT. Ball back to you, Maria. So this was a multi-center retrospective diagnostic accuracy study. Um, they, used, they used just one CT scanner for it, um, all of the scans that were acquired, so from one single site. Um, and then had uh, six different radiologists from three different institutions. Um, and they used a recruitment period from the 1st of April 2017 to the 22nd of April 2017. Um, 
and they tried to minimize um, issues with um, biases uh, using different stats models or blinding of radiologists. So sometimes they were shown the they, they were always shown um, a request, um, but nothing else really. Um, and some of the requests, if you delve in delve into the, um, it. Some of them didn't even say where the abdominal pain was or any suggested diagnosis either, and some of them did. Um, so they had a cohort of 201 patients um, and they used a power calculation. Yes, Sebastian. Um, to come up with a number of uh, 202 patients. Well, Excellent. Excellent. So um, the technology that they use um, is quite interesting, actually. They use CT images that are acquired with IV contrast and they use then material decomposition. Basically, uh, they look at one CT scan, but then they use virtual uh, technology to subtract the contrast and take the contrast away from the pictures. And they offer then the radiologist the possibility of interpreting a scan without contrast. Um, this is a technology that has been around for quite a while and has been studied quite extensively. Um, obviously, um, it can be done with different elements, not just iodine. And um, it does um, obviously allow a contemporaneous um, sort of assessment, like if you were effectively taking two phases, one without contrast and one with contrast. Um, definitions uh, for the purposes of this study are quite important because we are talking about interpretation of imaging. So the authors, when they're looking at the accuracy of, uh, of the radiologist, actually are looking at their ability of picking up a primary diagnosis, which would be the most likely explanation for the patient's symptoms. Now, as Maria mentioned already, um, sometimes those symptoms are presented to the radiologist in a bit of a sort of partial way through, through a request. Um, and obviously some of um, the requests might not be as complete or as accurate as others. Uh, the authors look also at actionable secondary diagnosis, that is to say, incidental findings that are not necessarily connected to the reason why the patient came into hospital, but that are potentially likely to affect the patient's management. And there's a lot to debunk here, and we will talk about this as we go along a little bit. Um, a few more definitions important to look at, look at. So the authors talk about overall accuracy, which is defined as the proportion of CT interpretations from a given rate in which all primary and actionable secondary diagnoses are correctly identified and no other false diagnoses are made. So basically, a report of a, a radiologist on an on-con CT needs to match the report from a contrast CT both for the primary diagnosis and all the other diagnosis. Uh, that's the overall accuracy. Uh, false positive rate is when um, the radiologist that is interpreting the pictures um, makes at least one false, false positive primary diagnosis or false positive action or secondary sign diagnosis. That means that if they get one wrong out of the two, uh, that is a false positive scan. Um, the false negative rate is equally sort of um, demanding towards the radiologist. So they want all uh, the primary and secondary diagnosis to be correct in order not to say that it is a false negative or a false positive. Um, I hope that makes sense. Right, uh, ball back to Maria for uh, uh, some results. Sorry for the child interrupting then. Um, so they had 201... Uh, patients included, uh, they discounted one because there wasn't enough images available. They had 108 females, mean age was 50.1, mean BMI was 25.5, and they had 104 with um, in a primary diagnosis within uh, 98 patients, and then they had uh, 17 actionable secondary diagnoses, and then they had uh, quite a few that didn't have um, any diagnosis whatsoever. And as you can see there in the table of some of the uh, diagnoses that were available there. Um, so um, 
four, as I've already said, about 46% had no primary or secondary actual diagnosis. Um, only 74 non-enhanced scans were interpreted correctly by all six radiologists. 31% had a primary diagnosis and 1% had a secondary diagnosis. And they came up with um, the unenhanced CT scans were 30% less accurate than contrast enhanced scans in a patient population with acute abdominal pain seen in an emergency department setting. Go back to Geo. Uh, a few more findings now. Um, as uh, we mentioned earlier on, uh, the bunch of, of radiologists that interpreted the scans, uh, there were six in total, were 50-50 split between consultant level and, and um, uh, SPR level, uh, if you look at the equivalent in, in the UK. And consultants tended to be uh, a bit more accurate at uh, picking up uh, primary diagnosis, particularly, however, they were less accurate at secondary diagnosis. That is to say, they were... Uh, creating more false positive findings. They were um, perhaps identifying pathology that was not uh, otherwise visible or doubting the presence of a pathology that was otherwise not um, confirmed on the contrast CT scan. Um, they have um, a relatively sort of high interrated variability, if you like. That is to say that a lot, uh, that there was variability between different raters looking at the same CT scans. Um, they use the GWET AC um, index for this, uh, which is something I've not particularly come across before. I tended to use other indicators for interrated variability. <clears throat> and uh, for normal scans, um, however, uh, there was less variability between different raters. So they were all consistent, more consistent with each other. Right. Uh, well, back to Maria for some limitations. So they reported that um, the limitations of this study were retrospective and that there was only a single institution sort of date source of the data. Um, they did mention reader biases and then obviously they had to subtract um, the oral or rectal or IV contrast from the images. Um, and that's what they said. All to do for the other ones. Sure. So... Um, as Maria mentioned, uh, CTs were all from one institution, which, uh, from a, for a certain extent, does help standardization of the images uh, and uh, and the protocols. Uh, however, reporters were from three institutions, and obviously there were six different radiologists. So, um, to a certain extent, um, it is not really an accurate reflection of real life. Um, certainly, I couldn't find any attempt at reducing the impact of uh, a lot of well-known cognitive biases that relates to reporting CT scans and generally um, images. And this does have an impact, particularly because these radiologists are fed uh, real-life uh, information that can obviously cause a significant swing in their um, um, sort of final interpretation of the scans. Um, I talked a lot about definitions and... Uh, those definitions are, to a certain extent, open to interpretation. For example, who decides what is an actionable secondary finding? I mean, if someone attends with a CT proven acute appendicitis and they have calcified asymptomatic gallstones in their gallbladder, that is not really a finding that would change the patient's management in any shape or form. Uh, I'm not sure, and I don't have enough data based on the paper, um, to say whether that was considered an actionable finding or not. And there's plenty of other different uh, examples that I could give you. Um, a further point is that sometimes a non-contrast CT scan is actually more helpful than a contrast CT scan. Uh, and one example that certainly uh, pops into mind is uh, the characterization of adrenal lesions, which is uh, traditionally done uh, with no contrast CT scans. Um, and a further important point is that sometimes the issue is not so much determining a diagnosis, but rather uh, the ins and outs of the diagnosis itself. For example, if you do have bowel obstruction, um, you can you can probably detect that on a contrast or non-contrast CT scan. It'd be much harder to determine whether the bowel that is obstructed is enhancing or not. Um, you will be able to detect uh, signs of, of ischemia only when they are quite advanced on a non-contrast CT scan. Um, 
a further point is that uh, there was absolutely no correlation with the final clinical diagnosis and what actually happened to the patient. So um, this study only looks at CT scans, not what actually happened to the patients. And if the uh, primary radiological diagnosis that was given in real life or um, by a different radiologist interpreting the pictures a posteriori actually uh, related with uh, the uh, clinical diagnosis that was made. And this leads me to uh, what's the point? Um, if in the mass majority of the cases, we are not in a situation where uh, we don't have to worry about an AKI, we don't have to worry about an allergic reaction, uh, is there really a point in trying to push for a um, non contrast CT scan in uh, this patient population? And uh, finally, a quick comment on rubbish in, rubbish out. If the request for a CT scan is rubbish, meaning is uh, performed for the sake of putting a request in and the information that is put on the request form itself is not accurate because the scan has already been discussed and agreed upon. Um, obviously, um, the result that you get in real life and the result that you get by someone just looking at a request uh, is going to be very different. So if you put rubbish in, you're going to get rubbish out. That's, that's unavoidable. And that might have biased uh, some of the results that we've seen. Um, so uh, I'll leave uh, um, to Maria to um, close up. So um, thanks, Gio. Unenhanced CT scans are 30% less accurate than contrast enhanced scans for primary radiological diagnosis of abdominal pain. Um, so the good points in study, one machine was used for all the CT scans and a uh, sample size calculation was used. Bad uh, definitions of actionable finding and interpretation bias of request. Clinical, it's a common problem, abdominal pain, so it's relevant to most, most people in ED and also ourselves as general surgeons. And obviously the negatives is mix and match of diagnosis and then absence of clinical correlation. As usual, a brief summary of what we discussed after the paper presentation. We discussed a few further points compared to the limitations that we presented during our talk. A key element to consider when assessing any piece of research is related to the nature of the population that is investigated. The authors highlight very well how uh, they feel a uh, no contrast CT scan can be helpful in the presence of a low EGFR or allergy to contrast. In practice often, especially in the presence of a low EGFR, uh, we are um, forced to perform a CT with contrast in order to obtain the information that uh, we require. Uh, so it would have been interesting to know how many of the patients included in this study actually had a relatively low EGFR that would have then forced the clinician to consider the use of a non-contrast CT scan because those patients are the ones that would obviously benefit the most from a study like this. Finally, um, adopting a CT report as a diagnostic gold standard is certainly relevant for the purposes of this study. However, uh, adopting a more clinical approach would have been perhaps helpful uh, to understand exactly what the CT findings actually correlated with uh, on a clinical point of view. The same applies to the interpretation as we discussed of uh, actionable and non-actionable findings. Right. I'll uh, leave you to uh, Professor Sabah lecture. Firstly, uh, I've got to say that um, I've got to make clear that I'm not a statistician. I don't have any formal qualifications and therefore uh, um, be cautious about um, taking on board uh, everything you hear from me uh, when I'm talking about statistics. This is simply based on my experience and my reading. Secondly, um, if you're a researcher or if you're a trainee planning to do research, um, you will often need to do some statistical testing yourself and uh, you can be rest uh, assured that um, it's going to be very difficult for you to get expert statistical input, um, especially uh, if you need input on doing simple inferential methods. And I think to a certain extent, uh, everyone who's doing or anyone who's doing research um, ought to be familiar with some of the basic concepts of inferential testing. So uh, the first thing to um, 
explain or reiterate is the difference between inferential and descriptive statistics. We talked about descriptive statistics before. Essentially, descriptive statistics provide a useful summary or summaries of the data in front of you. We've talked about this in our previous episodes. And if you are interested, it might be uh, worth your while reviewing Kramser chapters 13 to 15, where we talk about how we describe um, a data set. So inferential methods essentially allow us to make inferences about the data. In other words, they enable you to test the hypothesis in front of you. The hypothesis will be based on the clinical or research question you have. We spent some time talking about hypothesis testing, p-values and confidence intervals. Um, and uh, again, it might be useful to go back and review those if you're not comfortable with these concepts. So hypothesis testing uh, was in CRAM search chapter one, p-values and confidence intervals were discussed in CRAM search chapter 17. Um, when we talk about inferential methods or statistical methods that allow you to test hypotheses, there are some very uh, straightforward, um, simple methods like the chi-square test and the Fisher's exact test and so on, and some complicated methods. And we thought it might be useful for trainees uh, if we could do it, um, if we could discuss some of the simple inferential methods uh, that uh, people can then refer to and um, make use of those um, these discussions whenever they are called upon to do these tests. So. That's the brief introduction for uh, what we're going to discuss today, which is the chi-square test. The chi-square test is also uh, known by some other uh, names, um, the Pearson's chi-square test, or the chi-square test of association, or the chi-square test of independence. So this is what we're going to talk about. There are some variants of chi-square tests that I'm not going to elaborate on today, but I'll name those variants at the end of this talk. Essentially, this is a non-parametric test. So most statistical methods are divided into two categories, parametric tests and non-parametric tests. In non-parametric tests, uh, you do not make any assumption of the way the data is distributed. Like for example, um, the opposite of non-parametric tests would be parametric tests, which um, rely um, on the fact that the data is normally distributed. Here, for these non-parametric tests, you don't make any assumptions about how the data uh, is distributed. And the chi-square test essentially looks for statistical significance of the association between two categorical variables. We talked about data types before, so I won't um, um, explain that in any great detail, but categorical variables are data that are grouped, um, grouped into categories. So it's not like measurement or continuous or quantitative data. So these are qualitative data types. It's always good to talk about um, these things with examples, examples that hopefully surgical trainees and medical trainees can relate to. So I'm going to talk about thyroid cancer as an example, and um, essentially uh, dwell on two aspects of thyroid cancer. One is the presentation. Uh, you could divide thyroid cancer patients' uh, presentation into asymptomatic or symptomatic groups. We know that asymptomatic thyroid cancer is on the increase. Uh, we see patients where the cancer has been picked up on scans done for unrelated conditions or during investigation and treatment of benign disease such as Graves' disease or multinodal goiter. And we also obviously have the category of symptomatic patients, the patients come with the lump or the dysphagia or swallowing or swallowing or breathing problems and so on. Now, when it comes to thyroid cancer histology, the vast majority of thyroid cancer are what we call differentiated thyroid cancer. That's the most common type and also the type with the best prognosis. And we think that a number of these incidentally directed cancer or asymptomatic cancer belong to this category. That's what we think. There are some other um, uh, cancer uh, thyroid cancer subtypes, and I've listed them here. Um, it's about uh, five or six different types, but they're all really uncommon compared to differentiated thyroid cancer. So one of the questions um, people have had for some time and has been addressed in some studies is that, um, is there a relationship between the mode of presentation i.e. symptomatic or asymptomatic, and histology, 
i.e. differentiated heart cancer or other types. Um, another way of asking this question is whether the histological type um, vary by the mode of presentation. So that's the clinical question. So you've got two categorical variables here. One is presentation, asymptomatic or symptomatic. The other is histology, differentiated heart cancer or non-differentiated heart cancer. So uh, let's suppose um, you have a data set um, and uh, let's suppose you got the data um, on presentation and histology from uh, around 270 patients, 271 to be precise. And you've got this table here, a two by two contingency table, wherein you show the relationship between histology in as two separate columns versus mode of presentation as two separate rows. So this is this kind of table is a really useful way of presenting the relationship between two categorical variables. Now, what does this table tell you? Now, you could say that if you look at the overall um, uh, total um, patients with heart cancer, um, regardless of the mode of presentation, 92% of patients have differentiated heart cancer. Yeah, In the um, asymptomatic group, that increases to 97%. And in the symptomatic group, um, it uh, drops to 88%. So clearly there's a difference and uh, this table tells you that um, there's much more differential thyroid cancer in the asymptomatic group, which is kind of what most thyroid surgeons would expect. And the question then is, um, yes, fine, there's a difference, but could this difference in this particular study have arisen just due to chance? And that's why we need to test for statistical significance. So um, if your null hypothesis is that the histological type is not different in the two groups, which means your alternative hypothesis will be that uh, histology is in some way linked to presentation, then um, you then have to decide on a specific statistical test that could look at the data and test the null hypothesis. Now, what test to use uh, is a separate topic in itself, in itself, and that's based on the nature of the data, the type of the data, whether it's categorical or quantitative, whether it's normally distributed, things like that. The number of groups, here we've got symptomatic versus asymptomatic. In some instances, you could have three or four groups. So based on all of these uh, different parameters, you then have to decide what statistical test to use. And I'm not going to go into the details of how you decide on what statistical test to use, except to say that in this particular setting, uh, you use the chi-square test. Like I said before, this is a non-parametric test, and it's a test that tests, that looks at the association between two categorical variables. So, um, so let's look at the uh, table again. So like I said before, uh, you've got um, 92 or 91.5% of um, all patients have differentiated heart cancer. And the observed numbers in this particular study um, for the symptomatic and the asymptomatic are depicted in this table. Now, what you then have to think about is what would the expected numbers be, assuming that there's no difference in histology in the symptomatic and asymptomatic arms. And I've calculated the expected numbers based on the proportion of DTC and no DTC in uh, the entire cohort of patients. So I've done the calculations for the expected numbers, what you would expect if you didn't see a difference. And then you have to be looking at the difference between the observed numbers and the expected numbers for each of these cells. So if you have a two by two table, you've got four cells. And for each of these cells, you look at what the observed numbers are in the study, and what you would have expected if there's no difference in histology between the symptomatic and asymptomatic group. And then you calculate the O minus E or the observed minus expected. You then um, have to look at, uh, do some more calculations. Essentially, um, you take the square of the observed minus expected relative to the expected numbers. So O minus E square divided by E. And this gives you 
a magnitude of the difference between the observed uh, and the expected. And you then add all of those. So you add the observed minus expected whole square divided by expected for each of the four cells. And then you get a number, which is essentially what the chi-square statistic is all about. So essentially what you've done so far in very plain and uh, simple terms or as simple as I can make it is you're seeing how much uh, uh, you would expect if there's no difference between the arms and you're looking to see the difference between the observed and expected and the um, you're calculating the chi-square statistic and the higher the chi-square statistic, the more the groups are going to be different. Okay, I hope that makes some sense. So essentially, that's what the chi-square statistic is. First, you obtain the square of the difference between the observed and expected values for each cell. Divide, divide this by the expected value and then add these values across all cells. And the value here is 7.32. Now, the next thing to do um, in, the, in understanding the principles of a chi-square test is to think about the concept called degrees of freedom. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of this concept. Suffice to say that the degrees of freedom gives you an idea of the number of independent pieces of information you have in a data set. For example, in a two by two table, um, if you have the total number of patients and you have the total um, row totals and the column totals, you just need one of these cells to be able to compute the other cells. Um, let's say you've got 100 symptomatic and 100 asymptomatic people, and you get 50 um, symptomatic patients who have differential thyroid cancer, then you can calculate the number of people without differential thyroid cancer, and you can even work out the number of people who are asymptomatic um, across the two histological groups. So this is what degrees of freedom are meant to do. Um, if you're doing a chi-square test, um, then essentially the degree of freedom is number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. Here in a two by two table, the degree of freedom is one. And uh, I apologize if this sounds a bit complicated, but you do have to know uh, the degrees of freedom before you can calculate um, the probability or the p-value, which is what you want to get to at the end of um, this kind of analysis. So you have the chi-square statistic, you have the degree of freedom, and then you want to know what the probability is of getting the value of 7.32 or higher than 7.32, given the degree of freedom of one. And in the days when we didn't have access to the software that we have now, uh, you would look up a probability distribution table that kind of looks like this. I know this, is, um, this looks complicated, but essentially, on one hand, you have the degrees of freedom uh, as the rows, and as the column headings, you've got the p-value, and you then have to plot your 7.32 against the degree of freedom, and you come here and you find that the probability um, that relates to 7.32 is between 0 0.01 and 0 0.005. So essentially, you're saying, the probability of getting a chi-square statistic of 7.32 or higher is between 0 0.01 and 0 0.005. Uh, in other words, the p-value is less than 0 0.01. Of course, you've got uh, the software, uh, a number of different uh, commercial and freely available software that will do these calculations for you. But I thought I should explain the process so that you get a slightly better understanding of what actually um, happens when the chi-square statistic is being calculated. So um, another important thing for uh, trainees and researchers to know is how to report on a chi-square statistic. Ideally, you have to give the actual statistic, the chi-square statistic, which is 7.32. You also have to mention the degrees of freedom. That depends on whether it's a two by two table or a different kind of table. You have to talk about the total number of patients um, or subjects uh, or units of study, and then you give the p-value. Now, because the p-value is less than 0 0.05, which is the conventional threshold, you can say that you reject the null hypothesis. 
in other words, um, you can say that there is likely to be an association between these two variables, between the mode of presentation and histology. Keep in mind that the p-value only gives you uh, an idea of the strength of statistical significance. It does not give you an idea of the strength of association. You know they are linked and you're only expressing the certainty to which you know they are linked by giving a p-value or having a low p-value. But you don't know how strongly they are linked, if that makes sense. Now, there are a number of assumptions that uh, um, that have to be met before you can do a chi-square test. And I'll just go through these assumptions um, fairly briefly. The first one is that the data in a two by two table should be frequencies. They shouldn't be percentages. You have to put the raw numbers in. The second assumption is that these groups are independent. So the groups in this example being people were presenting with symptomatic or asymptomatic um, cancer. The third thing is that every subject or every patient contributes to only one cell, or the cells are mutually exclusive. So uh, you, you should not do a chi-square test if you have uh, uh, some kind of variable um, that is being studied in a before-after situation. And finally, quite important, um, the number should be adequate. You can't have really low numbers and single digits and say you're going to do a chi-square test. Now, what numbers are adequate? Well, it depends on what reference you look up. But essentially, if the total number is less than 20, then a standard chi-square test is probably not ideal. If the numbers are between 20 and 40 and the smallest expected value is less than five in any cell, then again, you shouldn't be doing the standard chi-square test. Um, if you have a, a table that's more than uh, two by two, i.e. table with a degree of freedom more than one, then no more than 20% of the cells should have uh, should be less than five and no cell um, should have less than one or no cell should be empty. So these are some uh, rules of thumbs that you can use to make a judgment on whether you can do a simple chi-square test. And if the numbers are really small and not able to meet these assumptions, there are some other things that you can do, but that's outside the scope of this um, discussion. So um, a quick um, summary of some other tests that are very much related to the chi-square test. Um, they're all listed in here. There's a chi-square with Yates correction and the Fisher's exact test. These are particularly useful when your numbers are really small. There's a chi-square test for trend. Uh, it's um, a test that you use when the groups are ordered. Uh, like for example, if you have cancer uh, split across three grades, grade one, grade two, grade three. Now you know two is worse than one and three is worse than two. So there's some ordering. So in that kind of um, setting, you could use the chi-square test for trend. There's a McNemars test that is used for before after comparisons where you shouldn't use these traditional chi-square tests. And then there are two other slightly uh, uh, related, but slightly different sort of chi-square tests, uh, which relate to different settings. One is a chi-square goodness of fit, and the, and the other is a chi-square test of homogeneity. Um, we'll talk about this in a later uh, discussion. And if you are really interested, I would suggest that you look up these two short um, uh, references that I put up on the screen, and they're quite easy to understand and easy to follow. Okay, that's it. Any questions? Any feedback is useful. Um, the last thing I want to do is uh, um, go on about concepts that people don't find useful or interesting um, and people don't value them. There's not much point doing these kinds of things. These are quite dry subjects. So uh, uh, I guess uh, unless you uh, practice them, you're going to forget them. But hopefully it's a useful reference to look up as and when you need it. I certainly would think so. Okay. Um, should we do a quick demonstration? Yeah. On... Oh, yeah, I completely forgot that. Yeah, let's do the demonstration. Right. So let's have a look 
So Geo is going to put up a, a freely available software called Jamov. And um, you can tell us about that Geo and show um, how you would do a chi-square test on the same example. So yeah, we'll make it super quick. Um, so Jamovi is a completely uh, open source and freely available software. Um, you can find it on jamovi.org. You can probably see the my browser window uh, on the shared desktop uh, as I speak. Uh, you can also use it uh, in the cloud. Uh, so you can just play with it, just put some random numbers in it and have a go and see how it works. Or you can just install it. I use it fairly regularly for a lot of my projects. And very quickly, um, I am going to use the same uh, data set that Prof used to create this um, uh, this analysis, okay? If you, like most people, keep things uh, on a, an Excel sheet, you can very quickly just import it by using the special import function and then clicking on it. And as you can see, even a fairly sizable data set like the one that Prof uh, sent me and used for his example gets imported fairly quickly. Now, because I made some changes to this data set um, after um, importing it, and I've already saved them, I'm going to open the one that um, I've got here. Right. So um, to do a chi square is actually fairly simple, it comes as a bundle. Uh, test this loads and we'll discover the functions of Jamovi as we go along in the next few sessions. But you just go on frequencies, independent samples, chi square tests of association, and you can spot pretty much straight away that the other tests here that we mentioned, like um, chi square goodness of fit and the McNamara's test. Um, you find the variables that uh, you're looking at. So we looked at symptomatic or not, and we put it in a row. And then we go down and look at DTC or not and put it in a column and simply look at the results. So as you can see, this table uh, matches the one that uh, Prof Saba had on, uh, on his presentation earlier on. Um, and uh, um, as you can see very simply, um, it gives you a chi-square value as well as p-value. And you can also do more things plots and other statistics that you can potentially add on as you need them. Um, I think given that it's freely available uh, and given that you can just download it and have a go at it, uh, I will probably just experiment with it and see how you find it. Um, it is a very useful software. It's based on R, which I'm sure a lot of you will have heard of. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep ramming your life with our surgical podcast.